Hello and welcome to Dialogue, coming to you from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. Being regarded as one of the most serious anti-corruption campaigns in China's modern history, the country's anti-graft efforts have managed to achieve some impressive results with the crackdown of Xu Caihou, a former vice chairman of the Central Military Commission, who has been accused of taking money and property in exchange for promotions and other favors. He was expelled from the Chinese Communist Party to face bribery charges. And now the case has been handed over to military prosecutors. So how to assess the anti-graft campaign going on in China so far? How successful will it be? What are some of the preconditions to guarantee its total success? And how will the Chinese government balance between the heavy tasks of anti-corruption campaign and the enormous challenges of moving a new round of reform ahead? To answer all of these very important questions, I'm joined in the studio by Professor Wang Chengguang from the Law School of Tsinghua University. Professor, welcome to our program. Thank you. Meanwhile, we are also happy to be joined in the studio by Professor Fu Jun from the School of Government with Peking University. Well, at the same time, we would also like to welcome Edward Lehman, Managing Director of Lehman Lee and Xu. That's a law firm based in China. But before we go to a discussion, gentlemen, with the three of you, let's take a look at this background report. New investigations, tough punishments, expulsion from office. Every day brings news of another scalp claimed in the fight against corruption. But the past weeks saw the campaign step up to another level, with several top officials, so-called tigers, facing charges. Among the most prominent was Xu Caihou, former vice chairman of China's Central Military Commission. He now stands accused of bribery and is set to face a court-martial. Others include Jiang Jiamin, former head of the state-owned Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, Li Dongsheng, former vice minister of public security, and Wang Yongchun, former vice general manager of the China National Petroleum Corporation. Following their expulsion from the party, Chinese President Xi Jinping called on officials to keep clean and use their power responsibly. He also said party members should understand the severe dangers the party is facing, including corruption and isolation from the people. She made similar comments when he took office a year and a half ago. Ever since, those words have been matched by actions. Since November 2012, 30 officials of provincial and ministerial level or higher have been investigated for corruption. In the first half of the year, nearly 900 officials, including tigers and flies, were investigated or punished, more than the whole year of 2013. As well as prosecutions, the campaign has pushed officials to clean up their act. Bureaucrats have been urged to be more responsive to the public, and public displays of extravagance now face strong disapproval. In a press conference earlier in March, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang reassured the nation that high office would offer no protection to corrupt officials. China shows no tolerance for corrupt behaviors and corrupt officials. No matter who he is and how senior his position is, if he violates the discipline of the party and the law, he will be seriously dealt with and be punished to the full extent of the law. This cartoon was posted on the website of the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, the party's top disciplinary body. The site has become a popular source for the latest news on corruption investigations. Ordinary citizens are also encouraged to send in anonymous information about corruption. From high-level prosecutions to grassroots information, the campaign against corruption has kicked into a new gear as the fight continues to root out the tigers and the flies. Gentlemen, welcome to Dialogue. Every week, and recently, almost every day, we could hear two to three names of those corrupt officials or executives of SOEs or state-owned enterprises being dragged down from their official positions and being investigated. So far, Professor Wang, what do you think about the scale and the depth of the anti-graft campaign going on right now in China. Well, just to give one sentence, so far so good. I think the campaign is quite successful, and in terms of uh, dragging down some of the corrupted officials, and also trying to clear up the atmosphere, which is trying to establish a new austere style of life and also of work 
within the party and also within the government. So we can see actually there are two tracks. On one track is to crack down the, uh, the, the corruption. Mm -hmm. And also on the other track is trying to clear up the atmosphere to set up a good environment in order to keep a clean style of the government. Professor Fu, your thoughts? Well, the very nature of corruption uh, tells us it's very difficult to estimate the extent and the depth of uh, the corruption problem. Mm -hmm. But from what we uh, see and hear so far, it seems uh, uh, if you count the number of uh, uh, inspection tours up and down the country, the number certainly has uh, increased dramatically. But that, to me, is a reflection of probably a long accumulation of uh, uh, the problems of corruption uh, over the years right. and the problem now is so severe that you have to move. Um, well, if you have a very serious case of a corruption, a lot of cases of corruption, that also reflects uh, uh, institutional flaws in our system. Which and so far, mm -hmm. what I have seen is uh, uh, this is uh, probably a ad hoc approach to deal with uh, the effects first. We still have to do more to deal with the causes of the corruption right. years down the road. We're going to go to some of questions related to that later, but if, Professor Wang, the corruption issue as severe as what Professor Fu previously anticipated, then enormous amount of efforts really have to put into the anti-corruption campaign and yes, therefore sir. how can China balance some of its other tasks we all understand not only anti-corruption this country needs to crack on it but also uh, some of the other important issues like reform like how to deal with the international community and uh, what is going to be China's aspirations in the future all of these are tasks of similar importance what do you think about that well, first of all, let me echo Professor Fu's statement. The corruption situation in China is really serious. The increasing number of the, well, the disposed, um, uh, disclosed corruption officials has been increasing. Mm. That's an indication of the severity of the corruption right. situation. And secondly, I think anti-corruption is one part of the overall reform uh, which is ongoing in China. Mm. And the social reform and the social transition is actually a big uh, mission for China. And anti corruption is one part of it, and which fits into this overall agenda of social reform. And without social reform, anti corruption mm. will not be successful. Right. Namely, that we need to set up a new system political and also anti-corruption regimes, etc. Therefore, we can solve the, anti, uh, the corruption problem in China. So in All this right. way, they actually, this too goes, on with each other, goes along with So what other. exactly is the current system? We also have Edward Lehman, Managing Director Lehman Li and Xu sitting here with us. Edward, you've been in China, in this country for quite a long time. You've also interact with the Chinese legal community. Help us to understand, particularly our international viewers, how does China's anti-corruption system work? What is this organization, CCDIN, how is it really working with all of the other anti-corruption apparatus here in this country? Yeah, and thanks, Tianwei. Being an outside observer and having been here a long time, I, this, uh, this, the, the CCDI is actually the uh, Central Commission on Discipline and Inspection. Now that is a, a group that's underneath the Communist Party, uh, underneath the party, and the party actually does its own uh, investigation. It can actually detain people uh, and, and collect evidence. And I think we've seen it with the case of Bo Xi Lai, where this body goes ahead and does uh, activity uh, and then dismisses them from the party and then they're brought into the legal system after that so it's it's a different kind of approach also you see with General uh, Xu for example that he's uh, gone through that process and now he's going to be fa facing court-martial uh, which is a different legal process but then I mean this is a, a situation where I think it's we we should be optimistic I mean there have been 31 uh, vice minister level and above officials being investigated by the uh, Central Commission mm -hmm. on Discipline and Inspection, and, uh, and then they'll eventually come into the legal system. I think part of it is an infrastructure problem with corruption as well. Do we have enough people uh, able and willing and impartial to be able to implement that system? That, that's something that government right. has to grapple with. Well, uh, Professor Wang, I want to come back to you because 
Do you agree with what the description is coming from Mr. Lehman, first of all, about China's anti-corruption system? And secondly, you see the CCDI being acting as an organization within the Chinese Communist Party, but the utmost punishment it can do to any official or executive of SOE who are Chinese Communist Party members is to expel them, he, him or her, from the party and the next step will have to move to the judicial system whether it's court martial or the civilian judicial system what, how do you think that system works so far is it smooth um, what are mm -hmm. some of the critical points as a legal worker you would look into well this is actually quite a debatable issue mm. and so far this regime this procedure is accepted because of we need to deal with the contingent problem and therefore we must set up some of the functional procedures and regimes to deal with the problem. As Professor Fu Jun already mentioned, this is a kind of an ad hoc mm. institution, namely to combine the party organization with the government organization together. And the reasons are quite uh, clear because uh, for formal criminal procedure will uh, receive a lot of approval before the investigation or arrest mm. and most of the corrupted officials are in the relatively high ranks or even at the provincial or state level so therefore any kind of move by the police or prosecutors will be immediately noticed by them mm -hmm. and they either will destroy the evidence or run away or do some other ways try to get away from the legal punishment. Therefore, the internal investigation by the party disciplinary organization is one of the most efficient ways currently in dealing with this corruption problem. And this investigation is within the party mm -hmm. and according to the party rules, which is the, uh, the regulations regarding investigation of the corrupted officials within the party. So therefore, it is not, uh, let's say, uh, a criminal punishment or criminal procedure. It's actually an uh, investigation and, uh, uh, on, uh, on the basis of the discipline requirement right. to ask the party members to stay from away from the office and try to, uh, well, uh, be uh, well in the pos particular position to receive the investigation within the party. Just like the name indicated, which is the Central Commission on Discipline Inspection right. of the Chinese Communist right. Party. And I'll go back to you, Professor Fu, because this is a very important issue that we are talking about here. How independent this CCDI will be and is so far, and how strong and powerful it will be and it is so far. Both of these are interesting and important questions. We have been hearing uh, from some media reports suggesting uh, that some of the very hard to crack cases, the CCDI would go directly sometimes to report to the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, which is Mr. Xi Jinping himself, in order to get enough backing and support and also to nail down a plan of how to punish and take out those corruptive officials for Communist Party members. What do you think about the necessity of this and also what does it mean in a way reflect the severity of corruption in this country or within the Chinese Communist Party? Well, as I indicated, as in a formal organization, uh, the Central uh, Commission for Inspection uh, is independent in terms of its relationship with the other government departments but when the, the party sy uh, system itself it's not independent in operational terms you have different layers of the government you also have uh, different layers of that party system mm -hmm. and in daily life since they have been mingling with each other for so long and uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, autonomy can be difficult mm -hmm. so in this case uh, as I also indicated it is sort of uh, uh, acting uh, in an ad hoc, uh, ad hoc way mm -hmm. and that's why you have observed now in some cases uh, the inspectors uh, uh, have uh, the authority 
uh, or uh, receive the authority from the very top the leadership question, they to report to the right. uh, very uh, top leadership within the party system. The question is, can you wait? Can you wait until a perfect l l rule of law being established? Can you wait until a perfect so-called democratic system being established and then crack down on corruption? What do you think about the t a give and take? Well, earlier I mentioned uh, what I've observed it seems to me is an ad hoc way to deal with a very severe problem of corruption. You have mm -hmm. to act to deal with a long process of accumulation of problems. But years down the road, if you are very serious about the root cause of the corruption, you need to be very serious of uh, better institutional arrangements in terms of uh, the party's relationship with uh, the government right. and also to build a checks and balance uh, system within the party system. Mr. Lehman, I also want you to come into this because it takes your country, the United States of America, quite a few decades, if not a few hundreds of years, in order to establish a system so that corruption would not have much room to move around. What do you think about the current uh, uh, apparatus that we have here in China, both within the Chinese Communist Party and also the Chinese judicial system? And secondly, can we wait until everything's perfect before we act on cracking on um, corruption. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think you can wait till everything's perfect. I mean, it's never a perfect situation. I think uh, building laws, policies, and regulations for any country. You know, I come from a state, the state of Illinois. We've actually had four governors that have gone to prison. We have uh, one that just got out yesterday. We have, uh, uh, you know, one that's in prison now for 14 years. Um, so it, it happens in every society. It's not just endemic in uh, China, and, and I think people understand that, that it's all over the place. And it's a constant battle to be able to, uh, to, be able to fight corruption. And, and corruption is the cancer that eats away at any government, any society, whether it be the United States or China. Um, I think it's the, the, the party is doing a great thing by addressing this because they understand that that's a, a very serious issue. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the laws, policies, and regulations, they put in place an anti-corruption law in 2011 and another one in 2013. So they're trying to put these things in place. It's different from the, uh, the, the, the Central Commission um, for, for uh, the society uh, mm -hmm. in, in dealing. But I, I do think that th this is a very good start. Um, but it's something that has to be ongoing and you have to be vigilant in order to, uh, to, to, to try to curb right. it. I also believe with what Professor Wu, uh, Fu and Professor Wang was saying that we, there, you have to build up a foundation. I think there needs to be a foundation in the schools uh, at, at very young age, in the schools at university and middle schools that actually talk about uh, principles and, and what's right and what's wrong. And I think today, and, and we need that in the United States as well, I mean, where's our moral compass? And this needs to start at a very right. young age. So I, I think right. that's another thing to look at. A overall systematic approach has to be established, but how is it likely to be established? And what can be some of the challenges still ahead in China's anti-corruption campaign? We're going to discuss all of these issues right after this break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Dialogue. You're watching our program on CCTV News. I'm Tian Wei. With me in the studio, once again, we have three gentlemen with us. Professor Fu Jun from the School of Government with Peking University, Professor Wang Chengguang with the Law School of Tsinghua University, and last but certainly not least, Edward Lehman, Managing Director from the Lehman Lee and Xu, that's a local law firm based here in China. Gentlemen, earlier, the three of you have shared your expertise about the insider's look into China's anti-corruption campaign, but we'd like to move things a little bit further. Professor Wang, I would like to throw this first question to mm -hmm. you for the latter half. We've seen anti-corruption system being established in other countries, and some people suggest it has to come with three preconditions. One, quote unquote, a total democracy. Secondly, rule of law. And thirdly, quote unquote, an independent press. But we all understand at this moment the three fronts is in development here in China. So, what do you make of the current approach here of anti corruption in this country? Is it providing an alternative mechanism to the already existing widely accepted world practice? Or actually, this is only what you both have indicated earlier ad hoc or transitional period. Uh, what eventually will China's anti-corruption system look like, Professor Wang? I know it's a general question, big question, but it's an important question to ask. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think the experience in other countries uh, apparently uh, useful 
for China's uh, anti-corruption uh, move. And also, secondly, I think each country has a different social environment, right. different uh, sources, and the rules of the corruption problem. Therefore, I don't think there is only one or uh, the, the, well, uh, only universal way of dealing uh, corruption. One size for problem. all. Mm. So therefore, in taking these two considerations, Chinese society is moving in the transitional period. Uh, in such a social background, there is no perfect system mm. uh, in dealing with corruption problem. Uh, but there are quite rampant corruption happening in China. So we have to deal with this problem, and we cannot wait. Therefore, we must come up with some ad hoc or transitional regimes or procedures in dealing with this problem. Mm. Therefore, we ended up in the current stage. So by no means we are seeing that they are perfect system right now in China. And of course, I think the high top leaders have a quite clear vision uh, in their statement. They mentioned that and we should not only deal with the symptom of the disease, but we must in the long term to set up a good system right. to deal with the problem. But from this the has room. a lot to do with the quality of those inspectors, right. because you, when you do not have a, a pure system to rely on 100%, then you really have to rely on every individual that's working in this anti-corruption campaign. And here's wh where the quotes come from. Uh, both the Chinese President Xi Jinping and also Mr. Wang Qishan, who's also heading China's anti corruption campaign at the moment is talking about one quote they say when you forge iron one has to be strong enough as well uh, in Chinese uh, so how much in a way responsibilities and burdens are being left on the shoulders of those individuals that are working now for this anti-corruption campaign and what does it mean for them really uh, this, of course, is a very uh, vivid uh, reflection of uh, the Chinese uh, traditional way of dealing with uh, problems. Uh, they tend to uh, depend on personal qualities. But if we are talking about modern state, modern marketplace, mm. to me what is more important is uh, uh, better institutional arrangements. For us to deal with the corruption, we have to understand the root cause of corruption. As Lord Acton says, it's a dictum. Uh, mm -hmm. Power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So you have to be very serious to deal with the, 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 the element of power. And you have to deal with the uh, power at the axiomatic level, right. the very top uh, power, not just the intermediate level or lower level uh, power. For the cases we have already seen, uh, many people have the illusion since they have uh, superiors uh, to cover up their uh, crimes, so they got carried away in the process. Mm. So China to build a more robust institutional uh, system to deal with the corruptions, uh, you have to deal with the power, as I said, at an axiomatic level, that means uh, the rule of law, mm. not rule by law. Rule of law means everyone is equal before the law. Right. And the media. Now, what is important with media is the system has to be transparent. It's information. Uh, democracy, the essence of democracy is you do not put checks on yourself. You need to let others to have a checks on your behavior. This is uh, what I understand as uh, the essence of the term uh, democracy. Right. Uh, we will not be able to have a lot of time to go into the details of every argument, but I think what you have, both of you have argued is very important. That is still how important it is to establish a system that is sound in order to correct down on corruption. But for now, I would like to go to Mr. Lehman uh, because we see here in China Officials make profits on their official positions when they're still in the office. Some would also argue, well, that's because, some jokingly talking about, it, because after they retire, they will not be able to do that. Unlike the U.S. system, of course, they were joking. They would say, well, you have revolving doors. The officials can make money after they retire or after they leave the office. They can make use of all the connections, all the favors they've mm. done to the others, and eventually make money also. What do you think about this? jokingly in a way to compare these two systems and whether corruption in a way 
it is only happening in the office, or actually it has to be extended, the examination of it, that it has to be extended further beyond even in the official position. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's a bit of, bit of uh, truth to all humor, I guess, all good humor. And, I mean, look at the Clintons, for example. Mr. and Mrs. Clinton were virtually uh, uh, br uh, impoverished uh, uh, when they left the White House, and now uh, they're making a great deal. Mr. Clinton is making a great deal of money. There's nothing wrong with that. They, they charge a lot of money for their speeches. Um, there are people, like you said, a revolving door that they were in government. They go into lobby and they work for private companies. I, I, I think that that system, obviously, than making money because you're an official, um, that, that that's where people have problems. And it is transparent. <laughs> Correct. And it's, it is transparent. In most of the cases. It, right. And there is reporting. And we know what Mr. Clinton makes because if right. Mrs. Clinton runs for office, then uh, they have to report that. So, you know, I, I think that there's some good that comes out of that system. I think there's still corruption in, in, in the American system. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but it's a better system to deal with it. We had even a vice president of the United States, Spiro Agnew, who was uh, charged with corruption under Richard Nixon. Uh, resigned and, uh, and faced uh, criminal penalties uh, mm. for, for, that, for that position. And the, the government didn't shake to its knees and it didn't fall apart. And so that's what we have to have in China where this is not a rare occurrence and it's not going to shake the, the foundations when you uh, arrest people for corruption, but uh, it, it goes in forward in a system. Right. Can Professor Fu. Can I add uh, something? Uh, it's an additional layer of complexity into the Chinese uh, uh, system. Now, so far, in our efforts to uh, do market-oriented reforms, we have uh, uh, marketized the goods and the services without a corresponding marketization of factors of production. Political power continue to control factors of production so that uh, when you have access to, on the one hand, uh, markets of goods and the services, on the other hand, to the power. It is so easy to give rise to the problem of uh, corruption. Mm. So Once this again, is you're talking about problem. the system building, uh, it's, isn't it's it? It's all part and a parcel of right. uh, the transitional nature of the Chinese economy. So, Professor Wang, before we go, I want to have very briefly from you, with all of these challenges I had about establishing a sound system against the corruption, how long will it would take China, really? We must do the campaign uh, of anti-corruption, right. and secondly, we must, in the long term, build up a sound legal system. These two should fit into each other and smoothly. I always find uh, that uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, uh, the Chinese late leader, has this wisdom of being predicting a lot of situations. He said about uh, filling the stone while crossing the river. I guess in this case, we're also trying to fill a stone while they're trying to figure out how to best crack down on corruption in this country. We hope the sceneries on the other side of the riverbank will be extremely beautiful. We want to thank both of you and also Mr. Lehman for being here with us. We want to thank you Professor Wang Chen Wang, Professor Fu Jun, and also Mr. Edward Lehman. Thank you so much for being with us. And thank you for watching. I'm Tianwei in Beijing.